and today we'll be dealing with vascular surgery and anesthesia very important topic the vascular patients are especially be breed of uh, patients who have these specific problems and some of the general guidelines may not hold good for these patients especially when you are talking about cardiac disease coming for non cardiac surgery with vascular disease so this is a very important area and uh, the important topics will be covered today and we we, we are uh, lucky to have dr deepak from manipal hospital dr murli krishna from jaydeva hospital uh, dr navina again uh, from narayana hrudayalaya and i myself and dr harish will also be there with me and i'm happy to see dr rupa shridhar i request all of you to participate in the discussion at the end and i would like to uh, request Dr. Deepak to introduce the first speaker and uh, go ahead with the session. Thank Dr. you, sir. Dr. Deepak is working in the Manipal Hospital, Bangalore, as a prominent anesthesiologist in the city. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending this webinar on anesthesia for vascular surgery, organized by ICU. So, we will carry on with this first topic uh, for today, perioperative evaluation for patient. Okay coming for vascular surgeries. Uh, first speaker will be Dr. Amit Mishra, who is a consultant anesthesiologist at Majumdar and Shah Hospital, Narana Health City. He has done a DMB anesthesia from Command, uh, Commando Hospital, Lucknow, and has been had served Army as an uh, anesthesia specialist from 9, 2012 to 2017. Before becoming a consultant anesthesiologist in uh, Majumdar and Shah Hospital, is he working as attending consultant at Fortis Hospital, uh, Rajesh Nagara. So, Dr. Amit, uh, you can Thank continue you, with the presentation. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. My topic for today is a pre-operative evaluation of a patient uh, before any vascular surgery. Coming to uh, broadly, the preoperative evaluation before anesthesia, before giving anesthesia to the patient for any vascular surgery, uh, it helps to identify the comorbidities that may lead to complications during the surgical procedure, anesthetic uh, induction, and uh, the preoperative period. Uh, coming to the goals of the preoperative evaluation are the first one is to assess the patient's medical status and then to determine if the patient can tolerate the anesthesia for the long vascular procedures. Reduce, it reduces the risk of the anesthesia and the surgery, and uh, the, the preoperative evaluation prepares the patient for the procedure. Uh, patients scheduled for elective procedures usually attend a preoperative evaluation one to two weeks before surgery. The preoperative evaluation includes uh, reviewing the patient's history, any cardiac symptoms, angina, dyspnea, PND, uh, along with the patient's functional status and the physical limitations. Performing a physical examination, that is a cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. Reviewing the available cardiac and the other diagnostic tests. Asking the questions about the patient's general health, medical conditions and current medication. Coming to the level of the procedural risk of uh, different uh, vascular interventions, uh, the high risk procedures with uh, greater than 5% major adverse cardiovascular events the vascular procedures included in this are open thoracic or abdominal aortic aneurysm repairs, infra bypass, open renal or mesenteric artery reconstruction. Coming to the intermediate risk, that is 1 to one to 5% of MACE, that is percutaneous procedures, endovascular aortic aneurysm repair, renal or mesenteric artery stenting, carotid artery stenting or endotrectomy, amputation of major extremities. The low risk vascular procedures where the risk is less than 1% MACE, that is arteriovenous fistula formation, superficial venous procedures, and digital amputation. Now, assessing the cardiac risk, the prior to any vascular procedure, whether it is open or endovascular, an assessment of a patient's risk for a cardiac event should be done. So, the first uh, cardiac risk index was revised cardiac risk index in, uh, developed in 1971 by Goldman et al. It was revised by Lee et al. in 1999. It stratifies the patient into three risk categories, that is low risk, intermediate, and high risk. Variables included for various risk predictions were only four, coronary artery disease, insulin-dependent diabetes, and congestive heart failure and renal insufficiency. Another uh, cardiac risk index is a vascular study group of New England cardiac risk index. It was developed in 2010. 
It is an accurate, practical, and a comprehensive risk prediction model for patients undergoing non-cardiac vascular surgery. It includes nine variables, patients, age, smoking, history of smoking, insulin-dependent di diabetes, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, abnormal cardiac stress test, long-term beta blocker treatment, COPD and serum creatinine level greater than 1.8 uh, milligram per deciliter. Uh, this index is better than the uh, RCRI as it is more accurately predicted the actual risk of cardiac complications before the vascular procedures. Another risk score is Gupta Mica score developed in 2011 by Gupta et al. Components include age, functional status, ASA American Society of Anesthesiologists classification, uh, creatinine greater than 1.5 milligram per DL and type of surgery to predict the risk of intraoperative or post-operative myocardial infarction or cardiac arrest. Another uh, latest one is American University of Beirut pre-operative cardiovascular evaluation study developed in 2019. Components include age greater than 75 years, history of heart disease, symptoms of angina or dyspnea, hemoglobin less than 12 milligram per deciliter, any vascular surgery previous or any emergency previous surgery. Coming to the summary of the uh, American Heart Association or American College of Cardiology and European Society of Cardiology and European Society of Anesthesiology recommendations on the preoperative cardiovascular evaluation and the management of patients undergoing vascular surgery. The requirement of electrocardiogram as told by ACC or AHA is the if undergoing intermediate uh, to high risk surgery and with the coronary artery disease, arrhythmia, peripheral artery disease, cerebrovascular disease or the structural heart disease. Same is uh, predicted by the uh, European Society. Uh, according to the requirement of the resting echocardiogram told by American Society, obtain if undergoing intermediate to high risk surgery and with the decompensated, if the patient is having a history of decompensated heart failure, valvular disease, structural heart disease or dyspnea of unclear etiology. In European Society, they have told maybe it may be considered if undergoing a high risk surgery. For stress testing, American society has told the low if there is a low risk of maze less than 1%, it is not required. If elevated risk of maze that is uh, greater than 1%, it is based on the METs. If METs is less than 4, it has to be done. And if it is METs are 4 to 10, then it is reasonable to forego. And if the METs are more than 10, it, it, is, not, it is not required. According to the European society, they have told that uh, it is required for high risk surgeries. If meds are less than four and, and the patient has at least one clinical risk factor that is ischemic heart disease, heart failure, stroke, transient ischemic attack, renal dysfunction or insulin dependent diabetes. Coming to coronary angiography, the routine coronary angiography is not recommended by both the societies. Coronary angiography and revascularization indicated only for the acute coronary syndrome. The preoperative evaluation prior to any major vascular surgery, a resting echo is required uh, resting ECG is required when emergency. Then there is emergency surgery. Uh, yes, if the surgery is em emergency surgery is there, then uh, we have to proceed with the vascular surgery. And if uh, it is not an emergency surgery and the patient has a history of heart failure, moderate to severe left-sided valvular disease, uh, structural heart disease, or dyspnea of any unclear etiology, and there is no transthoracic echo uh, within the past year, then it has to be done. Uh, yes, transthoracic echo is required. And if uh, it is uh, these uh, things are not there, then then the assessment of the mace is required. If the uh, uh, if the mace is less than one percent, uh, we can proceed with the vascular surgery. If uh, no, then we have to assess the meds. If meds are greater than ten, then we can uh, proceed with the vascular surgery. If uh, meds are uh, between four and ten, then we can go ahead with the low risk surgery. Otherwise, we have to do a stress test. A stress test. If there is evidence of moderate to large ischemia or uh, left main triple and uh, left main or a triple vessel disease is there then a coronary angiography is required this is the algorithm to guide the stress testing modality prior to major vascular surgery if the patient is able to walk a flight of stairs without stopping then uh, we can go ahead with the exercise based stress test and if the patient has a pre-existing left ventricular dysfunction wall motion abnormalities or poor acoustic window then a nuclear exercise stress test is required. If it is not there, then exercise echocardiogram stress test is okay. And uh, another, if the patient is not able to walk the flight of stairs, uh, then the pharmacologic based stress testing is required. Uh, then pre-existing, if the patient is having a pre-existing left ventricular dysfunction, wall motion abnormalities or poor acoustic window is there, then, uh, and yes, the patient has a high grade uh, heart block, uh, resting hypotension, uh, systolic blood pressure is less than 90. 
एम एम ऑफ मच्री और हाइपर टेंशन सिस्टोलिक ब्लड प्रेशर ग्रेटर देन टू हंड्रेड एक्टिव वीजिंग और पुअरली कंट्रोल सीजर इज देर देन इफ इट इज नॉट देर देन न्यूक्लियर फार्मोकोलॉजिक स्ट्रेस टेस्ट इज रिक्वायर्ड इफ इट इज देर देन वी आर टू कंसिडर अनदर मोटैलिटी मोडालिटी दैट इज सीटी कॉर्नरी और कॉर्नरी एनजियोग्राम and uh, if the patient has a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction resting peak systolic gradient is greater than 30 mm of mercury if it is there then we have to consider uh, again ct coronary or ct angiogram if it is not there then dobutamine stress echocardiogram can also be done coming this this slide shows the sensitivity and specificity and the contraindications for different stress testing modalities uh, the contraindications for stress exercise echocardiogram and dobutamine are acute coronary syndromes significant cardiac arrhythmias if they are uncontrolled ventricular arrhythmias complete heart block without a pacemaker uh, resting hypertension systolic blood pressure is greater than 180 mm of mercury uh, the dobutamine stress testing is contraindicated in patients with a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and the resting peak uh, late systolic gradient is greater than 30 mm of mercury according to the american heart association and american college of cardiology they recommend stress echocardiogram as an accurate and a superior tool for the cardiac risk assessment and the dobutamine uh, based nuclear pharmacologic test testing may be a reliable substitute if there is a reactive airway disease with the ongoing wheezing or uh, the patient has a poorly controlled uh, seizure disorder now coming to the perioperative management of the medications as most of the patients uh, coming for the vascular surgery have so many comorbidities and they are on many medications so first coming to the beta blockers according to the american heart association and the european uh, society of uh, cardiology uh, the beta blocker should not be started de novo in the low risk patients and if the patient is chronically on a beta blocker therapy uh, we have to continue if there are no contraindications this is recommended by the aha and acc and uh, european society of cardiology and uh, european society of anesthesiology if multiple rcri risk factors are there then uh, and uh, high risk myocardial ischemia or heart failure can consider we can consider starting a beta blocker and if they are started it should be started at least 7 days prior to the operative intervention uh, ac inhibitors and the uh, angiotensin receptor blockers uh, as advised by the american and the european societies it should not be started de novo if the patient is chronically on these uh, medications uh, they can continue if there are no contraindications if they are discontinued preoperatively they should be restarted soon in the post operative setting as soon as feasible AHA and ACC guidelines recommend continuing them perioperatively. If the heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction reasonable to start prior to operative intervention, if they are started, it should be started at least seven days prior to the operative intervention, as recommended by the European Society of Cardiology and European Society of Anesthesiology. Uh, statins, the fewer post-operative uh, cardiovascular events and improved uh, long-term overall mortality in the patients who had. Uh, received a statin therapy in the uh, perioperative setting the beneficial effects of perioperative statin therapy appear to be due to both the plaque, uh, plaque stabilizing effect and the anti inflammatory properties of the statins the uh, acc and aha and uh, esc and esa guidelines recommend that patients who are undergoing uh, major vascular surgery should either be continued on their uh, home high intensity statins or started on a high intensity statin in the preoperative period the antiplatelets the american heart association and american college of cardiology guidelines they recommend that uh, for elective non cardiac surgery uh, surgery uh, cardiac surgery uh, it should be ideally delayed uh, surgery should be ideally delayed for 30 days after the bare metal stent and 6 months after the drug eluting stent if there is no prior uh, percutaneous coronary intervention there is no benefit to starting aspirin prior to major vascular surgery Uh, start a low dose of aspirin prior to carotid endarterectomy and continue in the post operative period if a prior uh, uh, pci and the patient if there is a prior pci and the patient is on a single antiplatelet therapy chronically continue the single antiplatelet therapy if prior pci and uh, within one month of bare metal stent or six months of drug eluting stent uh, should continue the dual antiplatelet therapy because there is a due risk of uh, the st in stent thrombosis if the dual antiplatelet therapy is discontinued too early after the uh, percutaneous coronary intervention anticoagulants the warfarin should be held 3 to 5 days prior to major vascular surgery for uh, an inr uh, less than or equal to 1.5 prior to any operative intervention the american college of cardiology and american heart association recommends apixaban rivaroxaban and dabigatran 
uh, with a creatinine clearance of greater than or equal to 50 ml per minute, it should be within for two days prior to any operative intervention and resumed uh, two to three days uh, following the intervention. Dabigatrin with the creatinine clearance, if the patient has a creatinine clearance of less than 50 ml per minute, it should be withheld for four days prior to any intervention and should be resumed uh, two to three days following intervention. No bridging is required for the atrial fibrillation alone. Uh, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association recommends for the mechanical heart valves if a current generation mechanical aortic valve, example, uh, X by a leaflet valve alone without a thromboembolic risk factors like atrial fibrillation, previous thromboembolism, hypercoagulable state, left ventricular systolic dysfunction, bridging anticoagulation may be deferred. All other mechanical heart valves or if thromboembolic risk factors should be bridged with the low molecular weight or unfractionated heparin in the preoperative and the perioperative setting. Coming to the novel diabetic agents, the glucagon like peptide 1 receptor GLP-1 and analogs like semaglutide and liraglutide and sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors uh, like depaglifosin and empaglifosin. Uh, the SLG SGLT2 inhibitors have shown to be beneficial in reducing the death due to the cardiovascular causes and heart failure hospitalizations. The American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology recommends patients undergoing major vascular surgery, it is reasonable to hold outpatient non-insulin diabetes medications in the perioperative setting to facilitate inpatient glucose control and avoid hypoglycemic episodes. The key points to remember for the patients undergoing vascular surgery in the preoperative evaluation are patients undergoing major vascular surgery are at a high peri and post-operative risk for morbidity and mortality as compared to the other non-cardiac surgeries. Uh, secondly, uh, all patients uh, should receive a resting ECG prior to any surgical intervention. An echocardiogram can be completed if there is a history of heart failure, valve disease, or structural heart disease. The preoperative third, the preoperative non-invasive stress testing can be completed in patients with the poor functional status less than four METs. Patients with the mid-level functional status four to 10 METs can undergo stress testing if undergoing an operation with a high procedural risk. Fourth, there are several risk indices available to estimate surgical risk. The VSG, CRI, the Gupta Mica, and AUB, HAS2 risk indices appear to have better discriminatory ability than the RCRI. Fifth, all the patients should be started on statin therapy in the preoperative setting. Sixth, the beta blockers, the AC inhibitors, ARBs, and the antiplatelets should not be started de novo in the preoperative setting. Seventh, there is no known benefit to routine coronary artery revascularization in the preoperative setting. However, patients with high risk disease, left main disease, triple vessel disease, moderate to large territory ischemia should undergo revascularization prior to planned surgical intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Amit, for that nice insight, so, insightful presentation. Uh, we'll keep the question and answer at the end. Uh, moving on, I call upon Dr. Murli Krishna to introduce the next speaker. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, Murli, you can go. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, thanks for the opportunity to participate in this uh, seminar. I would like to thank Dr. Murli, sir, and uh, Dr. Harish for the opportunity. Uh, the next speaker uh, will be speaking on uh, abdominal aortic reconstruction doctor by dr achala so dr achala completed her uh, uh, mbbs in 2013 from kim subli and later by 2019 uh, she finished uh, md anesthesiology from uh, jamnagar gujarat and after that uh, she started working as a senior registrar currently a junior consultant and uh, hope to see you dr achala as a senior consultant soon over to you dr achala Good evening. I'm here to present abdominal aortic reconstruction. Why these surgeries are a challenge is because of the large incisions, extens extensive dissection, clamping and unclamping of the aorta, organ ischemia and reperfusion, fluid shifts, temperature fluctuations, and activation of neurohumeral and inflammatory responses. The incidence of abdominal aortic aneurysm is 8% in elderly men. The risk factors include age, smoking, family history, atherosclerotic diseases. The primary event in pathogenesis uh, is adventitial elastin regradation 
or elastolysis. The overall mortality rate after rupture of abdominal aortic aneurysm is more than 90%. The perioperative mortality for ruptured aortic aneurysm is around 50%. And the one year post-operative survival after a repair of an unruptured aortic aneurysm is 92%. The guidelines for repair based on the American Heart Association uh, says that an aortic aneurysm of size 4 cm to 5.5 cm surveillance has to be done and surgery is indicated in this group of patients if they become symptomatic or in a six month period there's an expansion of the aneurysm to more than 0.5 cm and uh, in the group of patients who have 5.5 cm to 5.9 cm size of aortic aneurysm there's a controversy, but uh, they say that because the one-year incidence of rupture in this group is similar to the post-op uh, mortality, surgery is indicated in all of these patients. Aorto-occlusive diseases, the most common site is infrarenal aorta and the iliac arteries. The treatment options are anatomic repair like aorto-bifemoral bypass and extra anatomic uh, repair like axillofemoral bypass and catheter-based endoluminal technique. Renal and visceral artery insufficiency is most commonly caused by atherosclerosis. The occlusive lesions are most common in proximal renal arteries, which activates the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which leads to poorly controlled hypertension even with maximal medical therapy, causing uh, repeated congestive heart failures or flash pulmonary edema. Bilateral involvement of the renal artery leads to renal failure. The visceral insufficiency is most commonly seen in inferior mesenteric artery and the mortality rates are 7 to 18%. The anesthetic management of uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm will be dealt by in these subheadings. Anesthetic goals is to maintain a stable hemodynamic during induction, laryngoscopy and immediate post-induction period, renal protection, stable hemodynamics during aortic clamping and unclamping, blood transfusion and goal-directed fluid therapy, maintenance of temperature and post-operative care. Anesthetic management. So these patients are given general anesthesia with or without epidural insertion. Intraoperative monitoring. Standard ASA monitoring is done. IV access, central venous cannulation is done and two peripheral wide bore IV access is obtained. Arterial catheter placement is done for uh, invasive BP monitoring and other dynamic monitoring like uh, pulse pressure variation and for serial ABG, uh, arterial blood gas monitoring. Cardiac output monitor is used to look at uh, stroke volume variation, systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output monitoring. And in case of supraceliac cross clamping, uh, transesophageal echocardiography is used to differentiate between hypovolemia versus myocardial dysfunction. Induction of anesthesia is uh, done using uh, the various induction agents like propofol or etomidate in titrated doses. Short-acting opioids like fentanyl and sufentanyl gives a stable hemodynamics during induction. Tracheal intubation is achieved using muscle relaxants. Volatile anesthetics may be used to blunt the response to tracheal intubation. And the other drugs that can be used to blunt the uh, tracheal uh, intubation response are esmolol, sodium nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, and clavidipine. And in case there is any hypotension, it can be tidied over by giving boluses of phenylephrine. Maintenance of anesthesia is using opioid and volatile anesthetics along with positive pressure ventilation. It is advisable to withhold the activation of epidural until stable hemodynamics is achieved after aortic unclamping. RCTs demonstrate no reduction in length of stay when epidural anesthesia is used, but it does show a reduction in post-operative hypertension and tachycardia. An RCT, the absent trial, was done comparing TVA versus sevoflurane-based anesthesia, and this also showed no cardioprotection in uh, the volatile agent-based anesthesia group. Aortic cross clamping. So the pathophysiology of cross clamping depends on the following factors like the level of cross clamping, the status of the left ventricle, degree of periaortic collateralization, intravascular blood volume and distribution, activation of the sympathetic nervous system, and anesthetic drugs and technique. 
the hemodynamic changes seen during or after the aortic cross clamping is an increase in the arterial blood pressure above the clamp and a reduction in uh, arterial BP below the clamp. There's increase in segmental wall motion abnormalities, left ventricular wall tension, pulmonary occlusion pressure, CVP and coronary blood flow. And there's a reduction in ejection fraction and cardiac output. The important metabolic changes seen after the aortic cross clamping are a reduction in total body oxygen consumption, decreased total body oxygen extraction, respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. So this is a table showing the cardiovascular changes in percentages uh, comparing the supraceliac aortic clamping versus the infraceliac that is suprarenal infraceliac and infrarenal cross clamping. And this shows that there's a higher percentage of change in the mean arterial blood pressure that there's a 54% increase in uh, MAP in supraceliac in comparison with the infrarenal and there's a greater fall in the ejection fraction that is around 38% in the supraceliac in comparison with a 3% fall in infrarenal aortic crust. This is a pictorial representation uh, which shows the uh, changes happening during the aortic cross clamping in comparison with aortic cross clamping with IVC uh, occlusion. So when aorta is cross clamped, there's an increase in the capacitance vessels uh, above and uh, above the in the upper body and in the left ventricle and when uh, this aortic cross clamp is uh, done along with the IVC uh, clamping there is no such difference. So once the aorta is cross clamped uh, there is increase in preload as there is passive recoil of the, of the uh, capacitance vessels distal to the clamp and also there is active veno construction constriction that, uh, proximal and distal to the to the clamp that increases the preload also there's an increase in the afterload which uh, is due to increase in impedance to the aortic flow also increase in arterial resistance due to the catecholamine release both of these increase the contractility and increase the coronary blood flow so in a patient who has a, a preserved myocardial uh, functionality, there's an increase in cardiac output. And in a person who has a myocardial dysfunction, there will be a fall in cardiac output. Ischemic complications with suprarenal clamping are renal failure, hepatic ischemia, coagulopathy, bovel infarction, and paraplegia. The factors contributing to renal dysfunction are ischemic reperfusion injury, fall in intravascular volume, embolization of the atherosclerotic debris, and surgical trauma to the renal artery. So renal dysfunction is attributable to fall in renal perfusion. Although the uh, pathophysiology of renal dysfunction is still unknown, acute tubular necrosis accounts for nearly all of the renal dysfunction and renal failure that occurs post-aortic reconstruction. So, uh, Acute renal failure occurs in approximately 3% of the elective infrarenal aortic reconstructions and a mortality rate of around 40% post-operative uh, uh, ARF. The adequacy of renal perfusion cannot be assumed by the urine output alone. The changes in renal hemodynamics are that there's a 75% increase in renal vascular resistance and a 38% decrease in the renal blood flow. How we preserve the renal function is by using pharmacological methods that include using mannitol, loop diuretics, and dopamine. So mannitol is an osmotic diuretic which acts by improving the renal cortical blood flow, reduces ischemia-induced renal vascular endothelial cell edema, reduces the vascular congestion, scavenges the free radicals, decreases renin secretion, and increases renal prostaglandin synthesis. The other drugs that can be used are loop diuretics and low-dose dopamine. Use of these agents, uh, we have to uh, monitor the patient closely because they cause hypovolemia leading to renal hypoperfusion and also increased myocardial oxygen consumption due to the, due to the increased inotropy. The therapeutic strategies or interventions that can be used uh, during the aortic clamping are afterload reduction by sodium nitro use of sodium nitroprusside and inhalational anesthetics, preload reduction by using nitroglycerin or controlled phlebotomy, 
renal protection as was discussed earlier. Now coming to the aortic unclamping. The factors affecting an unclamping physiology are similar like the level of aortic occlusion, total occlusion time, use of diverting support and intravascular volume. So hypotension is the most consistent response to unclamping. Uh, washout of the vasoactive and cardiodepressant mediators from the ischemic tissue is one of the causes to cause hypotension. The physiological changes associated with unclamping are hemodynamically, there is a decrease in myocardial contractility and arterial blood pressure. There is a decrease in cardiac output and central venous pressure along with a decrease in venous return. The important metabolic changes that are seen is there is an increase in total body oxygen consumption, increase in lactate production, increase in prostaglandins and increase in myocardial depressant factors. Also, it causes metabolic acidosis and hypothermia. So, aortic uh, unclamping is going to cause distal tissue ischemia which releases certain mediators that increases the permeability of the tissues and this causes loss of intravascular fluid leading to a central hypovolemia. Also, because of distal vasodilatation, uh, there is the shift of blood volume away from the central compartment, again leading to central hypovolemia, leading to reduced cardiac output and hypotension. The therapeutic interventions that can be done in preparation for aortic uh, unclamping are in inspired concentration of volatile anesthetics should be reduced. Vasodilators should be gradually reduced and discontinued before the unclamping. A moderate increase in intravascular fluid around 500 ml during the immediate uh, pre-release period should be done. In supraceliac unclamping, aggressive fluid res uh, resuscitation has to be done. And we have to replace the blood loss and avoid significant hypotension. In case there is significant hypotension, gradual release of the aortic clamp can be done and reapplication of the clamp and digital compression also can be used. Vasopressors may be initiated, uh, usually required in supraceliac unclamp. Blood transfusion. So these surgeries, there might be massive blood loss and transfusions have to be done in 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio. So PRBCs, FFPs, cryoprecipitate and platelets should be kept available. And in case of massive transfusions, thromboelastography can be used to decide upon which product is to be transfused. Also, uh, studies have found that 75% decrease in allogenic transfusions has been seen in cases where cell salvage was used. But uh, some of the disadvantages are that it is of high cost and also requires significant training and expertise. So normothermia is essential uh, in uh, these surgeries and it can be maintained by using warm IV fluids, warming blankets, underbody warming devices and increasing the ambient temperature of the OT. If hypothermia does occur intraoperatively, normothermia may be difficult to achieve and may delay the emergence and extubation. Also, the lower body should not be warmed during the cross clamping period as it can increase the injury to the tissue distal to the clamping due to increased metabolic demands. Spinal cord ischemia uh, is present with an incidence of around 10 to 20 percent for thoracoabdominal aortic repair and this has been extensively covered by uh, Dr. Niharika in the next talk. The post-operative period, extubation can be attempted if the patient uh, has had a stable intraoperative course with normothermia and metabolic and hemodynamic homeostasis. Adequate analgesia is key. Post-operative mechanical ventilation uh, is indicated if hypothermia is uh, there or there is hemodynamic and metabolic instability. Analgesia can be given uh, using the epidural. There is an RCT that found no particular advantage of epidural analgesia over the IV patient-controlled analgesia. Also, paravertebral blocks can be used to provide adequate analgesia post-operative. Here's a small note on the ruptured uh, aortic aneurysm repair. So in such patients, quick evaluation has to be done of hemodynamic status when the patient is received in the ER. Large bore IV accesses has to be secured. The most important determinant of survival is the time from reception of the patient to aortic cross clamping. Cross matching of PRBCs and FFPs, around 10 of each has to be sent. 
fluid and blood administration should not be enthusiastic as it may increase the intra abdominal hematoma and be deleterious to the recovery of the patient also rapid sequence induction should be done only when the surgeon is ready for incision as the tamponade effect of the tight abdominal muscles will be lost upon induction of anesthesia and this leads to catastrophic hemorrhage these are my references thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajala, for the wonderful uh, talk. Oh, over to Dr. Murugeshan sir to introduce the uh, next speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Niharika. The next topic is endovascular aortic repair. Niharika is uh, working at Narayana Rudayalaya Masudarsha Medical Center. As a junior consultant, and uh, she, uh, I would say that she's a very promising uh, anesthesiologist with a bright future to look up to. With that, I would like to ask Niharika to present her, uh, uh, I mean, deliberate on the endovascular procedures and what's the role of anesthesiologists in a very succinct manner. Thank you so much, Niharika. Over to you. Good evening. Uh, I will be talking about endovascular aortic repair. Endovascular aneurysm repair is a common procedure performed for abdominal aortic artery um, uh, aneurysms and because of its minimal invasiveness as compared to open surgical repair. It began experimentally in the 1960s and was pioneered by Parody et al. in 1991. Uh, subsequent FDA approvals have approved uh, grafts uh, starting from infrarenal and later proceeding up to uh, suprarenal and nowadays more complex grafts are available. In 1994, Dake et al. were the first to demonstrate uh, stent grafts for descending thoracic aortic aneurysms. Uh, these are uh, some examples of the uh, stent grafts available for endovascular repair. Uh, fenestrated stent grafts have been currently uh, been available for develop uh, for juxtarenal and pararenal aortic aneurysms highly customized with openings that align with the arteries that branch off the iota. Branch stand grafts are available for complex aneurysms. Customization on patient-specific anatomy is possible now with 3D aortic imaging. The endovascular approach can be undertaken without large incisions, extensive dissections, and prolonged aortic cross clamps. And uh, it also prevents significant blood loss and fluid shifts associated with open repair. Arterial access on, for endovascular repair depends on the basis of vessel size and degree of atherosclerotic disease. The technique requires usually a bilateral transverse groin incision. Uh, in patients with severely diseased femoral or iliac uh, arteries, balloon angioplasty or end arterectomy may be required to allow the passage of delivery system. Adjunctive retroperitoneal access may be required in around 20% of the patients. These in include uh, patients with small external iliac arteries that limit femoral access and a concomitant iliac artery aneurysm that precludes the distal fixation of the stent graft. A transverse lower abdominal incision with retroperitoneal dissection exposes the iliac artery and a synthetic conduit is sutured onto it. The, co the delivery system can be endoluminally placed into the iota through the iliac conduit. At the termination of the procedure, the condu conduit can be ligated and attached to the external iliac artery or to the common femoral artery. These are the advantages the endovascular repair offers over open repair, such as less blood loss and fewer, fewer transfusions, less fluid shifts, less hemodynamic disturbances, no cross clamping, less uh, distal tissue ischemia, end organ damage, earlier ambulation and shorter hospital stay, reduced ICU care and a more favor favorable 30-day survival. Endovascular repair is carried out in a specialized radiology suite or a hybrid operating theater with appropriate angiography facilities and the ability to convert to an open repair. All necessary precautions should be taken to protect the theater staff from ionizing radiation. Monitoring uh, for endovascular repair comprises of standard ASA monitors, an invasive arterial pressure monitor, 
which enables ABG analysis, early urine output, and continuous core temperature monitoring. Five lead endo uh, ECG can also be applied to detect ST changes. Large bore venous axis should be secured. Central venous axis can be considered for complex or long procedures. Availability of near patient testing for hemoglobin, glucose, lactate, and coagulation uh, testing such as rotem thromboelastography is uh, preferable. Evoked potentials monitoring is sometimes requested in patients with high risk of spinal cord ischemia. The anesthetic goals for endovascular repair is to provide hemodynamic step stability, preserve perfusion of vital organs, to avoid imbalance between myocardial oxygen and sub oxygen supply and demand, maintenance of intravascular volume and early identification and management of blood loss, normothermia, ensuring patient comfort, and adequate hydration to reduce the risk of contrast nephropathy. The anesthetic techniques can range from local, regional to general anesthesia, and the selection of technique falls on patient comfort and the choice of the anesthesiologist. Endovascular repair can take sometimes more than four hours, and patient comfort is difficult in regional techniques. Things to consider when selecting a technique are patient's comorbidities, the length of the procedure, the use of antiplatelets or anticoagulants, the ability to lie supine. General anesthesia is preferred over regional anesthesia in the following conditions. Usually, these patients are on antiplatelet medications and do require heparin intraoperatively. This may make regional anesthesia challenging. Blood pressure control is easier with general anesthesia and can be achieved by titration of anesthetic agents and vasopressors. If aneurysm ruptures during the procedure, the patient's airway is already secured in general anesthesia and transport to theater is easy. Breath holding on ventilator is easy and can be prolonged if necessary to improve image quality. Use of complex fenestrated graft and concomitant open surgery may also be required sometimes. It is uh, important to monitor the coag coagulation of the patient during uh, endovascular repair as the patients will be administered IV heparin due after cannulation of the access vessels. We must check activated clotting time three minutes after heparin and every 30 minutes thereafter. ACT should be maintained at 2 to 2.5 times the baseline. Reversal with protamine may be required at the end of procedure. Renal protection is an important part of endovascular repair. It has been extensively covered by Dr. Archila. Strategies for minimizing renal impairment are maintaining adequate hydration, limiting contrast load, and stopping nephrotoxic drugs. The combined guidelines for CIN prevention recommend volume expansion with normal saline or with isotonic sodium bicarbonate. Blood pressure control is also important during endovascular repair. Unless aortic uh, Occlusion balloons are used. Usually, hemodynamic instability is minimal. Persistent hypertension can be managed by beta blockers, and immediate control of hypertension is easily possible with the use of nitrates. Hypertension is more common in endovascular repair as the uh, pain stimuli is minimal. Infusion of low dose vasopressors may be considered. These are images of pre procedure and post procedure endovascular repair as you can see an abdominal uh, aortic aneurysm and a common iliac aneurysm have been stented using a branch stent graft this is another example of uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm which has been stented using a uh, stent graft post operatively these patients require intensive uh, care uh, intensive care continuous invasive blood pressure monitoring regular blood gas analysis and continuous uh, hemoglobin, serum electrolytes, and coagulation parameters should be performed. Regular lower limb arterial assessment clinically and with Doppler is crucial. Patients usually allow uh, are allowed to eat and drink the same day as surgery. However, continuous IV therapy should be encouraged to prevent the likelihood of CIN. Uh, the pain is usually minimal and can be managed by oral and IV analgesics and opioids. These are the following complications associated with endovascular repair. Surgical complications include maldeployment or malposition of graft, arterial rupture, delayed ruptures, stent graft thrombosis, endo leaks, graft migration. Medical complications include acute coronary syndromes, acute congestive cardiac failure, acute renal failure, arrhythmias, respiratory infections. Spinal cord ischemia 
is a devastating complications which is which so which is associated with endovascular repair it is more common in complex or ruptured endovascular repair the largest collateral artery uh, usually arises from t9 to t12 and is at more risk of occlusion during suprarenal grafting collaterals also arise from inter inferior mesenteric artery which are invariably included in, during infrarenal endovascular repairs the mechanism of spinal cord ischemia is crucial um coverage of feeder vessels following stent deployment preoperative imaging of these vessels to identify them is usually challenging clinical usage of fenestrated and branched stent grafts uh, in preserving the feeder vessels is yet to be demonstrated perioperative hypotension prolonged aortic occlusion and microemboli also contribute to spinal cord ischemia therapeutic strategies for the management of spinal cord ischemia include PSF drainage, hypothermia, and maintenance of arterial blood pressure. Spinal drains have been shown to be efficacious in prevention and reversal of spinal cord ischemia. Spinal drainage uh, of the CSF can be planned preoperatively in patients who are suspected to be at the risk of uh, spinal cord ischemia. Um, this is a device devised by the Narayana Hridale team, uh, which ensures uh, spinal drainage uh, by avoiding uh, excessive drain during uh, the post operative period as the uh, the drain amount can be controlled uh, by the anesthesiologist in during the post operative period however the best way to control uh, to prevent spinal cord ischemia is to maintain cardiac output and bp uh, augment blood pressure maintenance Endoleak is a very common complication of uh, endovascular repair. It is the inability to obtain or maintain complete exclusion of the aneurysm sac from the arterial blood flow. The concern is that any pressurization of the aneurysm or enlargement will lead to rupture. Endoleaks can be detected by angiography, CT, MRI, and by duplex ultrasound scanning. There are five types of endoleaks documented. Type 1 is when proximal or distal graft attachment site leaks. Type 2 is retrograde flow into the aneurysm by the side branches such as lumbar or inferior mesenteric arteries. Type 3 is caused by a defect in the graft either due to fabric tear or due to disconnection of modular overlap. Type 4 is graft wall porosity. Type 5 is an increase in the maximum aneurysm di diameter without any identifiable leak. Post-implantation syndrome is a very common and benign complication observed in endovascular repair. It is characterized by sepsis-like picture without any evidence of infection and is characterized by pyrexia, leukocytosis, and elevated inflammatory markers. Serious life-threatening complications are possible, such as multi-organ failure and coagulopathy. Coagulopathies can arise due to the significant fibrinolysis during the exclusion of larger aneurysms with endografts. Majority of these cases of uh, post-implantation syndrome are usually self-limiting. Important to exclude an infective cause and ensure symptomatic management with antipyretics and IV fluids. Emergency endovascular repair is becoming increasingly common as endovascular repair is being offered as the first line of treatment in case of emergency. Avoiding uh, conversion of open therapy, uh, co conversion to open surgery is possible, so patients should be prepped as for an open repair. The preoperative anesthetic management should be fast and focused. A standardized protocol is beneficial in an emergency and ensures effective decision making, coordination, mobilization of the multidisciplinary team to avoid any delay and helps in better patient outcomes. Preoperative CT can be done to decide whether the aortic morphology is suitable for endovascular repair. Rapid infusers and cell salvage should be readily available, as should inotropes and vasopressors. Arterial access should be taken prior to the procedure. The initial surgical step is to cannulate the femoral vessels with a uh, compliant aortic occlusion balloon. This balloon can be inflated to provide hemorrhage control if the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable. The procedure can be performed under local anesthesia with or without sedation. Regional anesthesia is best avoided due to the risk of coagulopathy. Sometimes endovascular, emergency endovascular repair needs to be converted to GA in situations where ventilatory compromise due to diaphragmatic splinting is 
possible. Pain and discomfort from enlarging hematoma, ischemic pain in the lower limbs, metabolic disturbances, and sometimes secondary procedures may be required, such as embolectomy or femorofemoral grafts. These are few uh, trials which were uh, landmarks in the development of the endovascular technique. The first trial is the Dutch Randomized Endovascular Aneurysm Management or the DREAM trial. Uh, this trial showed that the long-term survival in endovascular repair was similar to that of open uh, repair. The EVAR-1 trial was associated with lower post-operative uh, mortality in aneurysm-related deaths in the first six months. However, uh, patients undergoing endovascular, required did re endovascular repair did require re-interventions uh, at a later stage. Endovas EVAR-2 trial was for patients who were unfit for open surgery and uh, showed a high degree of mortality and morbid morbidity even with endovascular repair, although the aneurysm related deaths can significantly reduced in six months to four years post the procedure. A trial done uh, by Berry et al. Uh, for ruptured aneurysm uh, abdominal uh, iotas showed that uh, ruptured uh, abdominal iota aneurysms showed that the mortality still remains high at as up to 80%. Uh, protocols for the assessment and transfer of patients improve outcomes in such situations. Survival outcomes, however, are still comparable to open repair. Challenges faced by anesthesia are due, due to managing an unstable patient in a hybrid theater. Local anesthesia ensures a better 30-day mortality as compared to general anesthesia. Endovascular repair was associated with lower short-term mortality. Patients undergoing endovascular repair have a higher incidence of major comorbidities and should undergo a thorough preoperative assessment and optimization. A distinction should be made between a simple intrarenal endovascular repair and a complex suprarenal repair, and which carries a higher post-operative risk. Anesthesia preparation should be carried out with awareness that there is a risk of major hemorrhage and conversion to open procedure. Good teamwork and communication is essential. This is even more vital during an emergency. The scope and complexity of these procedures continue to advance and anesthesiologists are assuming an increasingly important role in multidisciplinary management of these cases. Thank you. Thank you, Niharika, for that lovely presentation on endovascular procedures. I think you have dealt with this subject very well in the limited time allotted to you. Thank you so much. Please stay back till the end of the session. If there are any questions pertaining to your presentation, we will address to you at the question answer session. Please stay back. With that, I would like to request the Dr. Navina to introduce the next speaker and then uh, uh, after that, we will have opened the session for question answers. Dr. Navina, as you know, is a um, well-known uh, consultant in anesthesiology at the Muzumdar Shaw Medical Center in Narayana of the Alaya Health City Complex. Thank you, Navina, for joining us and uh, over to you. Dr. Naveen, are you there? You have to unmute yourself and speak. Okay, I would like to introduce Dr. Ityananda, who is um, working with us at the Health City in Bomasandra, Bangalore. He is uh, working as a consultant presently with us. And he was associated with um, Hilavati Hospital in Mumbai and uh, Sri Bhagavati Municipal General Hospital and KM Hospital in Mumbai. Thank you so much, Nityananda, for joining us. And uh, please carry on with the presentation on carotid endotectomy. I think you will throw light on some of the um unclear areas in this subject thank you so much good evening everybody 
I'll be speaking on anesthesia uh, for carotid endarterectomy. Stroke is the second leading cause of death and the third leading cause of disability following heart disease and cancer. The strong association between stroke and carotid disease is well known. The principal cause is atherosclerosis at the bifurcation of common carotid artery with frequent extension into both the internal and external carotid arteries. The relevant anatomy, the most important thing is the, uh, the circle of fillies, which is formed by the anterior circulation that is internal carotid artery and the posterior circulation that is bilateral vertebral arteries. This along with the extracranial and anastomotic channels, which comes from, comes from the external carotids and leptomeningeal connections, they form the principal pathways of collateral fillies. Clinically, they can be asymptomatic or they can have amaurosis fugax. Uh, uh, transient ischemic attacks it can be non debilitating stroke or debilitating or fatal stroke. These are the risk factors metabolic syndromes, diabetes mellitus, advanced age more than 75 years, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, obesity, hyperuricemia, OCPs, hormones. Investigations mainly screening is by duplex ultrasound imaging and the confirmation is by angiogram. Treatment options, medical management, uh, mainly uh, antiplatelets, statins, antihypertensive, management of blood sugar levels and lifestyle changes. And carotid revascularization is done by either by surgical method that is carotid endarterectomy or non-surgical method that is, that is transfemoral carotid artery stenting. Coming to the indications for carotid endarterectomy, now if you look at the right side of the chart, for symptomatic patients, with car carotid stenosis with 70 to 99 percent block that is severe carotid stenosis the uh, carotid endarterectomy is recommended and where we cannot do like any high risk for carotid endarterectomy then carotid artery uh, stenting is a alternative uh, it is also uh, recommended it is also uh, uh, they also say that carotid stenosis with, with 50 to 69 percent of block uh, carotid endarterectomy should be considered and carotid artery stenting may be considered. And if you look at the uh, left side of the chart, for asymptomatic patient, the carotid stenosis with 60 to 90 99% block, if the life expectancy is more than five years with the favorable anatomy and more than one feature suggesting any high risk, uh, higher stroke risk on um, uh, best medical treatment, the carotid endarterectomy should be considered and carotid artery stenting may be considered. So this is the uh, uh, recent guidelines. Uh, this is from the European Society for Vascular Surgery 2023 guidelines. Now to do carotid endarterectomies or carotid stenting. The risk rate, the 30 day risk rate for stroke or death or MI should be less than 6% for symptomatic patient in that particular institution or by the uh, surgeon and for asymptomatic patient it should be less than three percent now this is an illustration showing that uh, over the 50 period of uh, 50 last 50 years the carotid endarterectomy the 30 day stroke or and death rates have decreased now it is around one to two uh, one to uh, two percent Similarly, the, for carotid stenting, 30 day stroke and death rates have decreased in the last 20 years to again 1 to 2 percent. Both are both have a comparable outcome. But the trend is now more towards carotid uh, stenting and more and more numbers of carotid stentings are being done uh, than carotid endarterectomy. Now, what are the high risk features for carotid endarterectomy? So patients who are having congestive heart failure, unstable angina, or coronary artery disease with left main disease, or more than two vessels with more than 70% stenosis, the recent MI or planned open heart surgery in, uh, within the next 30 days, or low EF patients with severe pulmonary disease or severe renal disease, or difficult anatom anatomy. So all these are candidates for, uh, for uh, carotid artery stenting. Carotid artery stenting are usually avoided in patients who are elderly, more than 75 years old, or any uh, uh, very uh, calcified uh, stenosis, or any 
floating thrombus is there or any high grade aortic arch atheroma is there in such cases carotid endarterectomy is preferred uh, this is briefly about the uh, procedure so surgically the uh, carotid artery uh, common carotid external carotid and internal carotid arteries are exposed So once they are uh, adequately exposed, heparin is given uh, to achieve an uh, ACT value of 250 to uh, 300 seconds, then cross clamping is done. After separating the uh, bifurcation from uh, carotid bifurcation from the circulation, arteriotomy is done. and the plaque is removed. The arteriotomy is either closed with the primary closure or sometimes they do a patch angioplasty. Shunting is done usually uh, uh, when there is an uh, evidence of any cerebral ischemia. There are uh, three schools of thoughts. Uh, some surgeons would do shunting regularly for all the patients. Some would never do any shunting for the anatomy. Some would do selective shunting based on the neuromonitor. This, uh, the disadvantages of these procedures are it, uh, 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 it can cause kinking and embolism can injure the distal internal carotid artery and the cerebral blood flow is not 100% uh, guaranteed. The shunts used are uh, this Prui Inahara shunt or sometimes they use Javit shunt. Pre-op anesthetic evaluation has been discussed, uh, discussed by Dr. Amir. The uh, uh, most important uh, uh, is are coronary artery disease and uh, hypertension. BP should be maintained uh, at least, uh, it should be less than 180 systolic and uh, less than 100 diastolic. Coronary artery disease is a leading cause of both early and late mortality in patients undergoing carotid and artery. So, uh, but uh, preoperative evaluation of myocardial function and ischemic potentials are, uh, are rarely done, uh, except in patients with the unstable angina recent MI with evidence of ongoing ischemia or decompensated congestive heart failure or significant valvular disease. I mean, severe uh, 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 patients who are having the both coronary artery disease and uh, uh, carotid uh, artery disease, so which one to do first, whether to do CABG or endotectomy first. So there is no uh, consensus on this uh, sequence, both uh, combined or stage surgeries can be done. To quote a couple of studies, there was one study that meta-analysis of staged versus combined carotid endotectomy and CMG. So they, they suggest uh, comparable outcomes in combined and staged approach for both. Another study, uh, it's a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, published in Annals of uh, Vascular Surgery. They say that they, they found a significant higher risk of 30-day uh, mortality and stroke and lower risk for MI as compared to staged procedure. So the best approach here would be uh, uh, most of the times it is the individualized approach depending on the patient factors and the experience of the surgeon. Goals of anesthesia management, uh, protection of the heart and brain from ischemic injury, control of the heart rate and blood pressure, ablation of surgical pain and stress response to have an awake patient at the end of the surgery for the purpose of neurological examination. Standard monitoring uh, include uh, all this ECG, oxygen saturation, the intra-arterial catheter for monitoring BP is a must, and neurological monitoring if uh, general anesthesia. So which is the best method of anesthesia? So uh, this is a landmark trial, GALA trial, it's a multi-center ran randomized control trial. So they found that there was no definitive dif uh, difference in outcomes between the two techniques. 
and no significant difference in the rate of perioperative stroke, MI and mortality at 30 days. Another recent uh, uh, analysis of uh, National Surgical Quality Improvement uh, Program database that they analyzed more than 40,000 patients. Uh, they also say that no difference in the perioperative stroke and mortality, but they also uh, say general anesthesia has increased risk of postoperative MI at 30 days. So the ultimate decision to use general anesthesia or regional anesthesia should be based on surgeon's experience, anesthesia experience, and patient's experience. So the advantages of general anesthesia are mainly immobility, potential for neuroprotection and controlled ventilation. The lack of direct neurological uh, monitoring during the surgery and uh, intraoperative hypotension, postoperative hypertension, the increased rate of patient use, these are some of the disadvantages. Regional anesthesia allows direct real-time neurological monitoring uh, and so reduced shunt rate, reduced hospital take. Uh, but there are risks associated with sitting block and the patient has to be cooperative. It should be able to lie flat and there is a restricted access to airway during surgery. So general anesthesia, important periods are during the intubation and laryngoscopy. The heart rate and blood pressure should be attended appropriately. And the maintenance of anesthesia Inhalational agents can be used. Isofluorine has got a lower the critical vision of the surgical blood flow. Sigofluorine uh, also equally effective. MAC of less than 0.5 should be uh, used when neuromonitoring is needed. And TY is also equally effective. Emergence again, the uh, emergence response should be uh, blunted using adequate uh, pharmacological methods. So intraoperative considerations. <coughs> so uh, boluses of all these drugs, phenylephrine, epidrine, levetolol, esmolol, cladipine, atropine, glycoperolate, should be readily available. And uh, once uh, carotids are cross-clamped, uh, VP should be maintained uh, between the patient's baseline and 20% uh, above the baseline. So uh, for this, you can use uh, phenylephrine or sometimes you can use uh, norepinephrine uh, solutions. So uh, surgical manipulations of carotid uh, sinus with activation of uh, baroreceptor reflexes can cause abrupt bradycardia and hypotension. So it may require uh, uh, atropine or glycopyrrolate uh, administration. The further uh, responses can be prevented by injection of uh, local anesthetics with no care. Uh, into the carotid sinus or around the carotid sheet. Other consideration, ventilation, hypercapnia should be avoided for the concern of uh, steel phenomenon. Uh, norma carbia should be maintained, norma glycemia, norma thermia. Neurological monitoring basically helps to decide on uh, patients who are uh, for patient, identifying patients who may require shunting during cross clamping or who may benefit from blood pressure augmentation. But no modality is uh, as effective as monitoring an awake patient. With general anesthesia, uh, EEG, somat uh, somatosensory evoked potentials, transcranial Doppler, internal carotid stump pressure, near infrared spectroscopy, all these have been used. Internal carotid stump pressure is a basically the pressure distilled to the clamping in ICU, which represents back pressure resulting from collateral. So, uh, pressure above 45 millimeters of mercury is considered appropriate. EEG, uh, any uh, attenuation of high frequency amplitude or development of a low frequency activity during carotid cross clamping is indicative of inadequate cerebral perfusion. But deep brain structures are not monitored and they may not be specific. Somatosensory of potential, any uh, uh, more than 50% reduction in amplitude of the cortical component is a significant indicator of in, uh, inadequate cerebral perfusion. Transcranial dopplers mainly measure ipsilateral uh, MCA, MCA blood flow velocities. So uh, they can also detect and quantify embolic signals uh, in the form of uh, high intensity transient uh, signals. It requires technical expertise and uh, most of the times it is used for uh, post-operative surgery. 
और पोस्ट ऑपरेटिव हाइपर सेरेब्रल ऑक्सीमेट्री और नियर इंफ्रारेड स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी बेसिकली वी डिक्रीज इन 20 परसेंट और मोर ऑफ रीजनल सैचुरेशन सोफिस्टिका सो दिस आर द मॉडलिटीज ऑफ सेरेब्रल फंक्शन मेंटेनिंग द फिजियोलॉजिकल पैरामीटर्स लाइक इंक्रीजिंग द बीपी एंड मेंटेनिंग नॉर्मल कार्डिया नॉर्मल सर्निया नॉर्मल ग्लाइसेमिया एंड एनेस्थेटिक्स बार्बिच रेट दैट थायपेंटल हैज बीन यूज्ड इन द पास्ट and surgical techniques are by age by uh, shunting and uh, it is also said that the patch and plasty is better than the primary glue so to prevent restenosis regional anesthesia should be avoided in patients with strong preference for ga there is a language barrier or difficult vascular anatomy it is accomplished by blocking c2 to c4 dermatomes either by superficial cervical plexus block intermediate cervical plexus block or deep cervical plexus block or combined approach cervical epidural and cervical paravertebral blocks are frequently used uh, you can use either the landmark technique or ultrasound guided technique uh, cervical plexus is formed by ventral rami of c1 through c4 and nerves pass laterally along the corresponding transverse process immediately posterior to the vertebral artery and vein superficial carotid uh, plexus block so the injection is given superficially just behind the posterior vertebra of the sternocleidomastoid in intermediate cervical plexus block the drug is given under the investing layer of the deep fascia of the neck deep cervical plexus block here the under uh, the drug is injected under deep cervical fascia as a single injection or a uh, single injection at c3 or multiple injection technique so it has its own set of uh, complications like accidental intravascular injection subdural injection subarachnoid block large neck hematoma recurrent lagrangian palsy or pericardial palsy so ultrasound guidance can also be used to a deep cervical plexus block where the transverse process will uh, as a hyperlucent uh, line other anesthetic approaches uh, uh, ga can be combined with superficial cervical plexus block local infiltration where the surgeon himself can anesthetize tissues layer by layer till he reaches the carotid shape the general anesthesia with the cooperative patient where he will be woken up by just that a uh, cross clamping has also been seen final decision should be based on surgeon patient's preference experience and expertise of anesthetic post or uh, post operative complication stroke can my are the most uh, debilitating and most important complication that causes morbidity and mortality post operative hypertension post operative hyperperfusion syndromes post operative hypotension renal nerve injuries recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries wound hematoma large causing defect these are all the post operative complications briefly about carotid stenting in uh, here uh, the femoral axis is taken and a guide catheter which has got a embolic protection device is uh, introduced it goes to the aorta goes to the arch of aorta from there it is maneuvered to the carotids and the embolic protection devices is uh, introduced beyond the stenosis after that balloon angioplasty is done so this is the time where there can be a severe uh, tachycardia so it may require ectopin or the like peripheral administration so once angioplasty is done stent is deployed and guide catheter guide catheter is withdrawn this is the picture showing uh, around 70 to 80% of carotid stenosis this is after the balloon angioplasty and uh, stent is being deployed good flow is established to summarize carotid endarctomy is a prophylactic surgery for prevention of stroke pre operative evaluation and optimization of modifiable risk factors is of paramount importance the choice of anesthesia depends on consideration of the advantages and disadvantages of each approach and on physician experience and patient preference excellent communication between anesthesia and surgical team is required throughout the procedure to ensure appropriate cerebral perfusion Tight hemodynamic control remains the priority in immediate post-operative care. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Nityananda, for that lovely presentation. And uh, now I request all the panelists, moderators, and speakers to turn their videos and uh, see if there are any questions on the chat box and then address them one after another. The uh, Dr. Minati Chaudhary wants to know. Which neurological monitoring? Uh, which neurological monitoring you prefer during carotid endarterectomy? I think the question is directed to Nityanand, and then I would like to have expert comments from Dr. Murli Krishna and Rupa Sridhar and anybody who would like to comment on this. First is uh, Nityananda, what is the uh, monitoring of choice in patients who have gone to the carotid endarterectomy? Nityananda, can you answer that question? In other words, you tell us what you do and what you think is the best monitor. Uh, sir, actually, we don't do any neuromonitoring in our hospital, sir. I see. Uh, but various uh, uh, methods have been advocated, like uh, transcranial uh, Doppler. According to you, which yeah. one is best? In a routine setup, like the usual setups we have, which one is preferable? Is it the cerebral oximetry, uh, the Doppler technique, or what is the choice you would like to use? I mean, as per the results, I mean, the studies, uh, there is nothing like one is superior over uh, another, sir. But uh, both NRI, NIRS and uh, transcranial Doppler, both are equally uh, good options, I would say. Sir. Yeah, I, I agree with that statement. Uh, Murali, Dr. Murali, do you want to say anything on that? Uh, what is the best monitoring in patients? Sorry, in yeah. In that, yes. Yeah, as Dr. Nelanjan said, we work in much more basic setup than yours. Uh, but so I'm a proponent of uh, routine shunting. Uh, within uh, two minutes, uh, we try to place the shunt in almost all the cases. So before doing endotractomy, we just do an arteriotomy and place the shunt. That is more uh, effective. And uh, having a dedicated uh, vascular anesthesia also just makes a lot of uh, difference in the outcome. And uh, we uh, monitor the pressures and maintain the mean uh, arterial pressure. So those two. Dr. Murli, your uh, phone has gone off. One, one of the, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, one, yeah. One of the most local anesthesia in carotid endotomy is uh, that's the most effective way of neuromonitoring. So, but as I, as I told, it needs a dedicated uh, anesthesiologist who is a specialist in blocks and a good and understanding and uh, a cooperative patient for that. So, in general anesthesia. As Dr. Niranjan told, we can rely on those uh, parameters. That's right. Any comments from anybody else? Rupa, do you want to say anything? Hmm. Oh, we we always use the shunt, the inarapuri yes. shunt. And uh, once the clamps are placed, we do the endotrectomy, place the inarapuri shunt and measure the stump pressure and yes. keep it above 45. That is what is done. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. Thank you, thank you for your... I mean, Rupa is from uh, Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute in Trivandrum. She is a professor of anesthesiology. Next question is, um, can we do CABG first when there is asymptomatic carotid disease? What's your plan to prevent perioperative stroke? Again, Nityananda. CABG can be done, sir, uh, uh, before asymptomatic uh, carotid disease. Uh, regarding the period, uh, methods to prevent perioperative stroke, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I would request the cardiac anesthetist to say about it. Because during the carotid, uh, if he is undergoing carotid surgery, we usually try to keep the uh, map above, at least 20% above the baseline right. now on right. the clamping parts. Right. right. One point so, I would like to add is, uh, yes, yes. In, a, in, a, in a scenario where there is a, uh, both coronary artery disease and uh, carotid artery disease. Yes. Address the symptomatic first. 
if the patient is symptomatic from a coronary point of view, uh, to address the coronary first. And other thing is, uh, uh, we are very conservative in terms of uh, endotrectomy or intervention for uh, asymptomatic uh, carotid uh, disease patients. So even a uh, stenosis of even 90% also, we try to manage conservatively if they are asymptomatic. And uh, in my discussion with our cardiac surgery colleagues, they say the risk of stroke is more to do with the quality of ascending aorta at the uh, coronary anastomosis level and the amount of atheroma right. there and microemboli right. rather than the carotid uh, stenosis. Right. I totally agree mm -hmm. with you. And uh, you mentioned that the whatever is more symptomatic that should be given the preference. Uh, what I would like to know is, do you do both of them together in one setting or yeah. will it be done separately in two different settings, symptomatic coronary? No, yeah, say if a patient has a symptomatic coronary and a carotid both, I would like to do a carotid endotrectomy first and then uh, coronary uh, reverse correction. Doing a carotid endotrectomy first, uh, the risk of uh, perioperative myocardial events are more. If you do a coronary first, the risk of uh, stroke events are more. If you do a combined procedure, the risk to life is more, the risk is more. It's like, you know, we have to balance and uh, take a decision based on individual patient. I agree. I agree. I totally agree with you. Uh, this, uh, I just wanted some clarification. Do you do the, both of them together in one sitting or uh, at a different uh, no, time? We, yeah, since uh, we are two teams, like, you know, vascular team will be doing carotid and uh, coronary team will be doing a coronary part. So we like uh, majority, 90% of the time, we try to keep it separately so that the blame should not be on uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> the person who has done the coronary should not put a blame on carotid. You do the carotid and give the stroke-free patient to the coronary so that you are clear. Right, right. That, that's a good strategy. Very good strategy. Uh, anybody else would like to comment? Deepak, Naveen, Rupa, Minati, Harish? Uh, in our sector, where the most carotid uh, endocrine is, the neurosurgeon will be doing so right, right. The, we will have the neurologist in, in and monitor EEG and give bus suppression of less than uh, 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 say less than ten uh, milliseconds uh, duration and right. during the cross clamping. Right, right. That's a good point. Thank you, thank you for that. Shall we go to the next question? Anybody wants to say anything on this issue about the carotid endotectomy plus CABG? So we'll go to another next question. Anesthesia method you prefer mostly local or regional, regional or uh, GA or a combination. I think it applies to carotid endotrectomy. Uh, Nityananda, I think it's up, uh, addressed to you because I think it refers to carotid endotrectomy. In our center, actually, sir, it mainly depends on the surgeons. We have surgeons both who'd like to under GA also, and some surgeons would like to do under uh, purely under local. So the decision is uh, mainly uh, depending on that, and okay. also patient preference. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the choice of technique depends upon the uh, comfortability, comfort of the surgeon, the tech, uh, expertise of the anesthesiologist. And the patient's uh, preference. That's what you mentioned in your slide. Yes, sir. So I think that will apply here. Good evening, sir. Yes, yes, yes. So sorry, a lot of Wi Fi issues at home. I'm at my hometown. Right, so, right, right. Yeah, preferably, we would like to do on a regional. So recently, we had one uh, case where on table right. patient uh, had stroke. Oh. So it was done by a vascular surgeon. So immediately, we abandoned the procedure and we shifted him to the cath lab. Uh, we do the emergency thrombectomy, thrombomyelectomy, all those things. So, I mean, oh. ideally, preferably under the regional anesthesia would be better. You would prefer regional. That's great. That's okay. great. Uh, shall I go to next question? If there are any comments, please feel free to raise your hand and say what you would like to say. Next question is, uh, do you use low dose dopamine? I feel I also wanted to ask this question. This question will be directed to Achala and Niharika. Renal protection during abdominal aortic surgery 
or endovascular stenting, do you still use low dose dopamine for renal protection? Niharika, are you there? Yes. Niharika and Atula, both of you, one after the other. Yes, so we, we use uh, mantol for new protection, so we don't use protection. Uh, who is speaking? It is Achala, is it? Achala, sir. Oh, Achala, sir. Can you put on your video so that we can yes, see can you on you the on. screen? Okay, you would like to use mantol. Yes. Niharika, what is your opinion? Uh, sir, uh, same that we use mannitol. We don't, uh, since it's the same center, we don't really start here, low dose dopamine, but uh, can be. Can be used. Do you think it can be used? Any other can responses? Use... Yes, sir. Sir, sir Navin, yes. Yes, yes. Sir, actually, we don't routinely use dopamine for renal protection, sir. Uh, what we like, it also depends on the cross clamping. Whether it is uh, above the renal arteries or a cross clamping, only one renal artery is clamped. So many other factors are uh, involved. Uh, I mean, routine dopamine definitely we are not using. Now, instead of that, what we do is we adequately prehydrate the patient. We maintain the volume status. We monitor all the PPVs, SPVs, all those things. So and based on that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't think routine uh, use of dopamine for renal protection is any more required. I see. But in the presentation, it was mentioned. Uh, Dr. Murali Krishna, do you want to say anything on this? Uh, no, no, sir. Uh, we routinely don't use them. Okay, thank you, thank you. Anybody else would like to say something on dopamine in uh, abdominal aortic surgery and endovascular stenting? Frankly, I am belong to the maybe earlier generation, so I still uh, use dopamine. Actually. The dopamine has been taken off for the clinical practice because in critical care unit, it has been shown to increase the tachycardia and uh, arrhythmias and did not show great benefit in septic patients. But in theater conditions, we use it for a short while and to, to I mean, my impression is that it may be uh, in these patients and uh, once the thing is done, you, you may stop it. You don't have to continue for long. My response, but uh, this is personal, it's not evidence-based, but personal opinion, I would say. Next question, we'll go to the next one is, um, uh, what are the common post-operative complications in abdominal aortic aneurysms? I think this will be answered by Achala. Yes. Abdominal yes. aortic aneurysm. That's what is mentioned, yes. so it will go to Achala. Yes. Stop it. We generally have AKI and complications in our setting. AKI, yes. Anybody else would like to respond to that question? Yeah, in open aneurysm repair, uh, it is uh, other than the AK and other things. Uh, paralytic ileus is uh, one of the most commonest uh, thing, and uh, some moment of uh, acidosis is also very commonly seen. In endovascular aneurysm repair, uh, a successful endovascular aneurysm always comes with a mild fever in uh, post-operative period. In some of the patients, you know. Uh, unexplained, uh, there will be some hemolysis and anemia will be there and leukocytosis is uh, seen in uh, post-implantation syndrome as mentioned by uh, our speaker. So that is uh, seen, not very common, but we do see and that gives a very confucius uh, picture and uh, difficult to explain to the patient attenders who are highly educated and uh, read this Google. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Any more responses for the same question? Common complications during abdominal aneurysm? Next question is, uh, is carotid stenting done under GA if the patient is disorientated? Nityananda, if the patient is disoriented, do you do the stenting under GA? That's the question. Usually, no, sir. Unless, uh, like Dr. Naveen uh, said about a case where we dropped the patient became uh, uh, suddenly disoriented. Uh, in uh, so in urgency he had to be rushed to angio uh, cath lab so, so such conditions probably yes otherwise routinely no 
I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Any other responses? In a disoriented patient, do you be? I, I think first we should uh, rule out the why the patient is disoriented, whether he had a stroke in before the surgery and then rule out any stroke and then go ahead with the procedure of, after ruling out uh, any uh, stroke as such. So if the or patient had other... a stroke, uh, the, if the Maybe. evidence shows that there is a stroke, will you go ahead with the stenting or what's your strategy? We should wait. Yeah, if the, if the stroke is already established one and is beyond four hours, uh, I think uh, we should not uh, uh, change it, sir. We, we may convert it to a hemorrhagic stroke from yes, ischemic yes. stroke to a hemorrhagic stroke. If it is in the, within that uh, golden uh, four hours, uh, then yes. I totally agree with you. Shall I go to the next question? Uh, this is a very nice question. Should the surplus will it be assessed before? Uh, theoretically, it is uh, useful, sir, in the sense uh, if it is an incomplete circle of willies, then uh, we, we may think of uh, doing shunting straight away. So that way, maybe it is useful. But uh... so if you do this thumb pressure, we, you we will get the similar information. Will that uh, suffice, or you would like to do the circle of willies assessment separately before uh, actual procedure? As a surgeon, I routinely prefer to know the uh, completionness of a uh, circle of Willis. That gives, you know, though I'm a routine shunt user, uh, say in about 2 to 5% of the cases, I'm unable to place the shunt, especially in women with the smaller uh, carotids. So it's difficult to place a shunt. In those kind of cases, uh, I'll be more happy if the circle of Willis is complete. Uh, you do DSA or? Sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, sir, in, the, in the in the CT only we ask our radiologists. We routinely get a carotid angio, including the circle of Willis, and uh, we get the information from our radiologist. Absolutely. We don't do we DSA or uh, we don't do balloon occlusion test uh, routinely. Okay. okay. I agree. I totally agree with that. Uh, input. Next question is, uh, could you please elaborate the measurement of MC velocity on transcranial doctor examination? I think this photo is regarding, uh, this is regarding carotid and uh, sir, sir, regarding this, uh, we don't have that uh, experience, but uh, from what I've read is, if it is uh, Around zero to fifteen percent of the preclamp value, then uh, the, uh, the this is the severe of uh, this thing, ischemic uh, chances. And if it is uh, fifteen to forty, it is mild, and more than forty, we can uh, it is it's no ischemia. Like yeah, I agree with that. It looks reasonable. Whatever you said, I think that's what we should do. If we look at the MCF flow velocity, and then. Uh, if it is severely compromised, as you said, uh, 0 to 15, it's an indication that we have to place a shunt or uh, do some ad additional maneuvers to see that uh, the that side of the brain is uh, not ischemic. I think th that's all the questions here. Um, I, I would request uh, the the moderators to just uh, comment on the presentations. Uh, Deepak, you want to say anything? We have covered four aspects of vascular surgery. That's preoperative evaluation, abdominal aortic aneurysms, endovascular stenting, and carotid endotectomy. Uh, do you would like to say something on the presentation. Deepak, are you there? Dr. Murli? Sir, I'm here. I, yes. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite insightful, sir. And I know Miss quite a uh, good presentation. Thank you. The uh, only you. thing I want to know this, uh, if uh, placing the epidural, I pay some, so suppose if I have uh, uh, abdominal aneurysm or open or endovascular, uh, when you place the epidural at uh, uh, when do you place the epidural? No, no, actually. 
sorry we couldn't hear can you repeat it yeah. little loudly yeah we try to use the it's already post office uh, in case uh, we had a massive blood transfusion, uh, then we prefer not to or do a take before we can place a uh, every to make sure that uh, there is no quiet. So, Ajla, did you say that you will place it post-operatively? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So, Deepak, uh, sir, what was the question, sir? So, when you want to place the epidural for a patient with coming for open surgery or endovascular surgery, when so the have... epidural, uh, so the placing epidurals, so they use the interoperative apparel. Uh, so there are different no, uh, thoughts, for, uh, di different thoughts, and different uh, institutes practice different ways. Correct. So like, you know, like some I just want to know your institution it, practice. So, so what we do at uh, Narayana is, sir, we will start it. I mean, uh, on the like on the table itself, we'll place the epidural. So by the time they prepare the patient, they open up the abdomen and they start the surgery. By the time they come to the aorta and clamping, the time of the it's over. almost yeah. more than two hours. So we will at least we'll maintain a gap of two hours after placing the epidural. That's what so, we are doing at Narayana. Yeah. And like yeah, but others are like they will place what, it is, what if the uh, ready tap uh, while uh, placing the epidural? Will you postpone the uh, surgery or we should uh, be no go ahead sir, with the actually as of now, till now, we have placed many epidurals. Uh, like a uh, few few times, you have come across bleed taps and all. But we have gone ahead with the surgeries uh, across uh, you know, touch wood that till now, there are no problems with that. Okay. Okay. The, the rule says that if there's a bloody tap, you have to postpone. You have to postpone. Yeah, we have to postpone. Yeah. postpone. Yeah. We had postponed one uh, case, uh, but uh, the studies, as uh, Navin said, it's almost there, there's not much of a difference, but we usually place it a previous day, so previous day previous or day, that's, that's day. better. Yeah, yeah, night, yeah, yeah. yeah. in continuation, continuation yes, yes. Yeah. Can, can I can I come in continuation yes, with the same question? Uh, yeah. I, I, I remember reading uh, during my exams in 2009 that it, there has to be at least eight to 12 hours uh, before uh, you place heparin. Uh, the epidural catheter should be on, like Dr. Deepak said previous day evening only, because in infrainguinal uh, surgeries, uh, the uh, epidural time and uh, heparin time is hardly uh, less than half an hour. But uh, that is uh, theory. Practically, as you people are practicing in Naran and Jairav also, we do most of the infrainguinal cases under uh, epidural anesthesia, and uh, we give epidural anesthesia and uh, simultaneously vein or waste and femoral, and within half an hour, uh, we'll be giving heparin. So yeah. far, we have not seen any epidural uh, hematoma, but what if it goes to a medical legal and uh, some patient develops, uh, do we really uh, justify ourselves? So legally, we can justify, sir. I mean, as per the recent protocols, uh, we can give IV unfractionated heparin after two hours. No, the, what he's saying no, is, uh, they are most of the time, within two hours, they will uh, give no, less than two hour. hours. Uh, very difficult to explain, sir. Half an hour, don't try that. Uh, let the junior be to start the case and let him do slowly. <laughs> That's what I think. It's a, but, it's a, yeah, it's better to wait. That's a good, that's a good tip. Yeah, you would send the junior PG first and uh, later on you'll get it in the picture. Uh, that's a very good tip. Actually. <laughs> so, uh, next is uh, Dr. Murali, you want to say anything on the presentations? Any lacking, any point you'd like to add? No, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, session, sir. I really enjoyed. I, I I rarely sit for entire one hour and listen. I, I was there for all the presentation and it was very precise. And uh, for a surgeon, if you, my, I am able to understand, that means the presentations are really good. Thank so you. that's nice, sir. One point is uh, in uh, one, one of the studies, uh, they say 93% of the patients will have uh, some amount of coronary artery disease. And mm -hmm. our events are, perioperative myocardial events are more in occlusive disease rather than aneurysms. In aneurysm, some of coronaries are normal, but in aorta iliac occlusive yes, disease yes. where they are undergoing open bypass, only yes. seven to eight percent of uh, critical ischemic patients will have normal coronaries. Mm -hmm. That is some of uh, this information yeah. is for the PGs who are uh, preparing for the exams. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you for that uh, point. Thank you so much, Navin. You would like to say anything, sir? Honestly, anything? I missed a few initial few slides, sir. But later on, he has covered all the. Uh, that, I mean, uh, the topic in detail. Uh, it's a good job, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you. So, I would like to thank all the speakers for their wonderful presentations and uh, 
and the input given from the panelists was invaluable dr deepak murli and uh, navin thank you so much and uh, srupa and minati choudhury harish were also present and uh, i would like to thank them for being present and participating in this harish you want to say anything no sir for actually uh, the, the placing of epidural actually we should not uh, give wrong information to the listeners it has to be like uh, two hours only whatever the practice or whatever we may be doing but uh, medical legally we are uh, bound if somebody takes uh, to medical legal uh, issues it's a problem sir. but no, uh, have, either have, yeah agree agree i have to see that the time period has to be followed strictly yeah yeah absolutely and the patient has to be uh, followed post operatively for any neurological deficit and if there is any suspicion immediately mri should be done and the possible hematoma if it is there must be evacuated very promptly and expeditiously yes, yes sir yes sir w one question to all the uh, uh, anesthesia logists who are here like you know is it uh, wise to combine spinal anesthesia and epidural anesthesia sometimes uh, Uh, the anesthetist prefers to give spinal if the epidural doesn't act. And is it a wise practice or is not uh, not good? What is your input, sir? Sir, if uh, like if you give spinal and then convert it to epidural, it's good and good, sir. But uh, because epidural failed, we will give spinal is a bad idea because by the time we have injected considerable amount of drug into the you know epidural space. And the by by such I mean subarachnoid space will be the volume will be reduced and the high chances of you know patient going for the uh, uh, high spinal hypotension bradycardia all those issues are there so if already they have given epidural drug better not to give the spinal no so epidural is not... just placed uh, okay. epidural is just placed they are not given the drugs but they routinely give spinal anesthesia and then that place can be given. That, that the only it depends upon the what type of surgery you are going for, especially yeah. for lower abdominal debridement or small. Uh, uh, no vascular reconstruction lasting uh, more than four hours. Okay. We can do, but uh, I would prefer to give the epidural one alone or with uh, alone with the epidural anesthesia. Yeah. Because the uh, as per these uh, as per the guidelines, I think it's only epidural spinal lab moves more, more uh, hemodynamic. Uh, Uh, instability and myocardial yeah. events are more uh, as per the theory, but in practice, uh, this is what they follow routinely in our hospital too. And that's why I just wanted to. No, so there are liver drugs, liver and even all those things uh, where you know hemodynamic, hemodynamic disturbances will be minimal. Uh, so the theoretically, as you said, uh, you know the disturbance, hemodynamic disturbance, more with spinal compared to epidural. Uh, but spine combined spinal epidural there are many articles I mean, there are many evidences uh, to suggest you know we can use both spinal combined spinal epidural we use it for peripheral uh, like you know fem femoral to popliteal bypass surgeries and all uh, we use yeah thank you thank you thank you so much i think we have answered all the questions which are there on the chat box and uh, we had a reasonable amount of discussion and thank you very much dr uh, jayashree is available dr sood do you want to say anything dr jayashree sood is uh, yeah yeah uh, very much here oh, yes? yeah ah thank you very much it was a very and can very... i say that uh, you are one of the top <laughs> most powerful lady anesthesiologists of the world no <laughs> the, that's just actually your... that is what uh, according to the lady uh, 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 rating dr sood is the fifth most powerful women anesthesiologists in the world chala <laughs> you are always so polite and always no 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 this is recorded <laughs> i am not quoting from my thank you so it's much all, it's thanks best. a lot uh, the whole webinar was so um, educative for all of us for all the students that uh, there were so many points to take home and thank you so much the only thing i was just wanting to remark is about this combined spinal epidural yes. but uh, combined spinal epidural is popular right and uh, i'm sure we are all using that at the set of the combined spinal so first we get the epidural space give the spinal and then of course uh, introduce the epidural catheter and the only advantage is that you get immediate onset of action and later on you can prolong it so we are doing it Uh, routinely in our hospital so i just want to say thank you very much 
for your time and for the effort you made to present this webinar. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Murli, for moderating it so well. Thanks a lot. And we'll be seeing you next week or some other time for yes. the remaining webinars. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And good, good evening and good night. You thank are you, sir. welcome to join thank the you, virtual sir. dinner now. The virtual <laughs> dinner is ready. Thank, thank you, you so thank, thank you, thank you, sir. you soon. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much. So with that, we come to the conclusion, everyone. Thank you so much for letting us host the session today. I hope you all had a seamless and hassle-free experience with us. So with all your last comment, we would like to conclude the session over here and really looking forward to hosting all again. Thank you so much and good night to all of you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you, Shreesh. Thanks, sir. Thank you.